Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, your weekly space update video to give you all the relevant news regarding Starship, rocket launches and events, and a space history summation in a nice quick format. Now, normally I start these videos by talking about the latest news regarding SpaceX's Starship, but today is, is no different actually. Let's take a look. <laughs> The vehicle that currently dominates the discussion around Starship testing is the first stage prototype Booster 3, which has been sitting out at test stand A since the 1st of July. Since then, we've seen a number of exciting updates in the vehicle. Firstly, we saw it sail through ambient pressure testing on the 8th, then we saw cryo testing go successfully on the 12th. We then, very excitingly, saw three Raptor engines installed on the 13th of July, and so hopes were high to see a static fire. Well. They did it! <laughs> Look at this gorgeous photo from SpaceX. Yes, we saw a full test duration firing of the three Raptor engines on the massive Super Heavy booster on the 19th of July, which hopefully means that SpaceX can now move straight on to launching Booster 4 and Ship 20 together to orbit without any major need for massive redesign or structural changes. Elon Musk later tweeted that depending on progress with Booster 4, SpaceX may in fact attempt a 9-engine firing on Booster 3. I mean, wow, a 9-engine static fire will definitely be an incredible sight to see. This will generate almost 2,000 metric tons of thrust, 1,800 to be exact. Definitely earth-shaking stuff, though as of right at this moment, all three Raptor engines have now been removed from the vehicle. This might simply be to allow for closer inspection of both the engines and the booster itself but we're keeping a close eye on Booster 3. Its successor, Booster 4, will have, of course, slightly more than 9 Raptors. It'll have 29, as it's still planned to be the rocket to make the first ever Starship trip to orbit, serving, of course, as the first stage for Starship Ship 20. As you can see from Brendan Lewis's latest diagram, both Booster 4 and indeed Starship 20 are well into production and are coming together really well. I imagine both vehicles will be completed within the next month. Of course, we still need a launch site from which to, you know, launch. <laughs> Luckily, progress on this part of the Starship orbital launch is also going very well. We saw the eighth and final segment hoisted to the top of the orbital launch integration tower, completing the massive structure. There is admittedly one more tiny bit left to go on the top to act as a kind of roof for segment eight, but for the most part, the tower's skeleton is now complete. Of course, lots of guts still need to go in, but in terms of the raw skeleton, things look done. One of the more iconic features of SpaceX's Falcon launch towers is this black metal grating around the tower's structure. Alexander Svan has made an excellent suggestion for a way this can be approved for the Starship Tower. Have the whole thing serve as a projection screen to serve both as a useful indicator of things like fuel levels and also just because, and I think you could all agree with me here, it looks epic. <laughs> Check out the link in the description for the full version of this video. In terms of remaining things that are guaranteed to be added to the tower, the big one is of course the booster catching system. We're still not 100% sure exactly how this will look, but I'm sure it's now not going to be too long before we start seeing it come together. It'll be some sort of trolley that moves up and down the tower via a pulley system driven by the massive drawworks hoist that SpaceX salvaged from one of its oil rigs, and OE of SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric has pieced together a potential look for the trolley based on photos we've seen from the likes of RGV aerial photography and other Boca Chica photographers. In addition to the trolley, there's also the crane system itself that's yet to be added which will lift the Starship vehicle onto the top of the Super Heavy rocket. With the completion of the tower, hopefully we'll now start seeing the more intriguing aspects of this structure come together over the next few weeks. So do make sure you're subscribed by hitting the button down below to both ensure that you stay up to date with Starship development and also to help support the channel. Before moving on to talking about everything else in the space industry we saw last week, and while I'm on the topic of desperate self-promotion, make sure you've hit that like button as well if you're liking the content of course, as it really does help give the channel a kick up in the algorithm. Anyway, that's it for Starship News this week, so now let's take a look at what else happened last week. The biggest launch last week, I'd say, was the 16th flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard, which differed significantly from the previous New Shepard launches, chiefly because this was the first time the rocket flew with people on board. You already know about this one, I'm sure. On the 20th of July, Jeff Bezos and his brother Mark, as well as Wally Funk and Oliver Damon, flew aboard the New Shepard rocket, crossing the Kármán line and into space. 
Interestingly, this flight netted the record of both flying the oldest and youngest person into space, with Wally Funk at 82 years old and Damon at 18. Damon was also the first paying customer for Blue Origin. His seat was initially sold for a cool $28 million to an unknown bidder, but that person later rescheduled to a later flight. Therefore, the seat went to the next highest bidder, who happened to be Damon's father, who let his son become the passenger instead. I'm just happy to see Wally finally get to fly to space. She was initially supposed to fly in the Mercury 13 program, an all-female astronaut program to put the first American woman in space, but despite excelling in her astronaut training, the program was cancelled before the women were to undergo their final pre flight tests. Better 61 years late than never, I guess. New Shepard 16 wasn't the only launch we saw last week. The day prior, on the 19th, China launched a Long March 2C, which placed three Yaogun reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit, as well as a Tianqi Internet of Things CubeSat. The day after New Shepard, on the 21st of July, saw the launch of a Proton M rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. This carried both the brand new space station module Norka and the European robotic arm. Norca was actually supposed to be launched in 2007, but due to a variety of delays, this has now turned into July 2021. At least now, it's finally on its way. It's en route to the Zvezda module, where it's expected to dock on the 29th of July. As mentioned, the launch also carried the European robotic arm, which will be the first robot arm able to work on the Russian space station segments, and is very interesting in that it will be able to walk around the exterior of the Russian segments, moving hand over hand between prefixed base points. Here's hoping this mission proceeds nominally, and the docking is successful. Speaking of ISS docking, SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavour spacecraft has been docked to the space station's Harmony module's forward-facing docking adapter since its initial arrival at the station. However, this parking spot is now to be used for the docking of Boeing Starliner as part of NASA's Boeing Orbital Flight Test 2. As such, NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, alongside JAXA astronaut Akihiko Hoshide and ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet, all hopped back into the Dragon capsule and maneuvered it around to the Harmony module's space-facing port on the 21st of July. All seems to have gone well, and so now all eyes are on the Boeing Starliner test vehicle, which will be launching uncrewed on the 30th of July. We'll cover that launch a little bit later on in the video. On the subject of upcoming launches, hopefully we should start seeing Rocket Lab's Electron make regular appearances in these videos again. Rocket Lab saw a mission loss during their 20th Electron flight back in May this year. The mission went well initially, the first stage performed perfectly, later returning to Earth under parachute for soft ocean landing, but upon second stage ignition, the engine computer detected that conditions for flight were not met and commanded a shutdown. Over the past couple of months, Rocket Lab have been hard at work diagnosing the issue, and last week they issued a statement confirming that they've now narrowed the problem down to an issue with the second stage engine's igniter, and they've been able to successfully recreate the anomaly in testing, and as such have implemented a fix to it in the manufacturing process of the rocket. It looks like they're keen to start flying again very soon, as they've already wheeled out their latest rocket to the launch complex for a wet dress rehearsal of the vehicle. There's currently no confirmed date or publicly released name for this mission, but we can expect more news to transpire over the next few days. The last bit of space news I wanted to cover from last week is another Schrodinger-style success in that I don't know. <laughs> this is a Soyuz 2.1V rocket set to launch from the Blasetska launch site about two hours after I plan on finishing this video, so I don't actually know if it flew. That being said, I think that out of all the rockets to bet on, Soyuz is pretty much as reliable as they come, so hopefully everything went well, and its payload, a Razbeg reconnaissance satellite for the Russian Ministry of Defense, is now safely operating in low Earth orbit. With Sawyer's wrapped, that's it for all the biggest news and events I wanted to cover from last week. So now then, let's take a look at what we're expecting to see this week. So far, there are three confirmed orbital launches for the week. The first is on the 29th of July and will be a Long March 2D, which will launch a Chinese Tianhui Earth Observation Satellite to low Earth orbit on behalf of the China National Space Administration. The second launch will be the next day, on the 30th, and will be the previously mentioned second test flight of Starliner, Boeing's commercial crew capsule. It'll be launched from Cape Canaveral by a trusty Atlas V and will be headed to dock with the International Space Station's Harmony module 
Capital where, of course, a parking space has now been cleared for it by Crew Dragon. It'll certainly be interesting to see the two commercial capsules simultaneously docked to the station for sure. With this only being a test flight, the Starliner capsule won't have anyone inside it, but provided this mission goes well, hopefully it won't be too long at all before we get to see people flying with Boeing to space in the near future. The third and final expected launch of the week will be an Ariane 5, which will launch two satellites from the French Guiana spaceport on the 30th of July. Both satellites are headed for geosynchronous Earth orbit, which takes a lot more fuel to reach than low Earth orbit, hence the need for the beefy Ariane 5. These satellites are both for communications, one on behalf of Brazil and one on behalf of France. I love seeing Ariane 5 launches, they always look so old school cool, and of course, the beautiful South American launch site always provides a nice backdrop for the flight. Here's hoping this one goes well, I imagine anticipation of keeping Ariane 5 success record squeaky clean is definitely being felt at Ariane Space as later in the year it'll be an Ariane 5 that launches the James Webb Telescope, the largest optical space telescope ever built and probably one of the most exciting and important flights of the year so really really don't want the rocket to explode with that in it. <laughs> no pressure Ariane, no pressure. For now that's a wrap on all the stuff I wanted to cover from last week so now let's move on to our final segment all the best spaceflight anniversaries that we'll see over the next few days. The first historic anniversary I want to discuss this week takes place today, the 26th of July, when in 1971 Apollo 15 was launched. This was a significant mission because, well, I mean, firstly because it involved landing men on the moon, but significant to the Apollo program itself due to the fact that this was the first mission to make use of the lunar roving vehicle. It was also the first of three J missions, which meant that the time spent on the lunar surface was much longer than the previous Apollo 11, 12 and 14 missions, and there was a greater focus on scientific investigation of the moon than on the previous missions. The Apollo 15 mission would see astronauts David R. Scott, Alfred M. Warden and James B. Irwin arrive in lunar orbit four days after launch. After orbital insertion was complete, astronauts Scott and Irwin made the descent down to the surface and touched down successfully. The lunar rover worked beautifully, reaching blistering speeds of 6 to 8 miles an hour, not bad for a car that weighed barely more than 200 kilograms. Other highlights of the mission included the collection of the Genesis rock, thought to be part of the moon's early crust, as well as the famous hammer and feather experiment carried out by Scott, which proved Galileo's theory that when there is no air resistance, objects fall at the same rate due to gravity regardless of their mass. The mission did receive a fair amount of negative press, however, as, without any authorization from NASA, the astronauts carried about 400 postal covers down to the surface of the moon, which were produced by a West German stamp dealer to be sold at a very high price. They were paid about US$43,000 each in today's money for carrying the covers down to the surface of the moon, although their actions were discovered and the crew were reprimanded by NASA, and none of the three astronauts of Apollo 15 ever flew to space again. The next anniversary takes place on the 27th of July and is a very big one. On this day in 2020, iconic, groundbreaking, life-changing even YouTube series Space This Week was started. I just thought it would be worth mentioning this since it really doesn't feel like I've been making these videos for this long, but I guess time flies when you're quarantined. I, I mean having fun. <laughs> this does bring me to the fact though that with this one year anniversary, I've now pretty much covered all the best historic anniversaries that would take place over a given year, which leaves the question of what to do about this segment of the video for future weeks. I've been keeping an eye on my analytics of these videos, particularly viewer retention, and I've noticed that despite the fact that a lot of you tell me that you enjoy the history segments, there is always a very sharp and significant decline in viewers when the history segments start, and the numbers continue to plummet fairly rapidly. So this is kind of sad to announce, but this will be the final space history segment featured in space this week, so I do hope you enjoy the rest of the rundown for the remainder of the week. I think though that for the majority of you, this will be a welcome change, and will help Help reduce the runtime of episodes and give me more time to focus on news surrounding Starship, which again, according to analytics, is the only segment a lot of people are here for, and of course news elsewhere in the industry, both for the week prior to the episode and for the upcoming seven days. 
Moving along, the next anniversary takes place on the 29th of July, when in 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or as it's better known, NASA, is created after President D. Eisenhower signed into law the National Aeronautics and Space Act. NASA succeeded the previous National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, and was envisioned to have a more civilian-oriented purpose, encouraging peaceful applications in space science. I'm sure the achievements of NASA need no introduction to this channel's audience. They've made some absolutely incredible achievements over the years, including the moon landings, Skylab, and the Space Shuttle. Hopefully their legacy will continue with the Space Launch System and the Artemis missions. I know one mission I'm particularly excited for is the upcoming Europa Clipper. Anyway, the next anniversary takes place on the 29th and was the launch of Mars 2020. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the happenings of this mission since it regularly gets mentioned in space this week. That's because this was the mission that placed the world's first ever nuclear-powered aircraft carrier on the surface of Mars. Or to be less epic sounding, but still no less remarkable, the landing of the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter on the surface of Mars. This, as we all know, went very well. The rover is currently happily working away on Mars and we've seen a number of successful flights from Ingenuity as well. I guess there's little need for me to go on. I'm sure it won't be too long before I'll be bringing up the dynamic duo again in later episodes of Space This Week as the mission continues to develop and move forward. Or upward, I guess, in the case of Ingenuity. <laughs> Next up, on the 30th of July in 1964, Ranger 7, launched by NASA a couple of days earlier, became the first ever United States spacecraft to send back close-up images of the lunar surface. And here's one of those photos on screen. <laughs> Ranger 7 wasn't an orbiter, but rather a lunar impactor, and so it crashed into the surface shortly after these images were taken. What's crucial is that the photos taken by the space probe seemed to suggest the moon did indeed have a surface that was smooth enough and solid enough to land the spacecraft on. While of course this couldn't be guaranteed until an actual soft landing was made, the photos nonetheless appeared to indicate that the surface was solid enough. And as we all know, this was the case. Take for example the footage of Apollo 15 that I used earlier in this video. And speaking of this video, I guess it's nearly over, as that was the last historic anniversary that I wanted to discuss this week. <laughs> And that's a wrap on another episode of Space This Week. I do hope you enjoyed it, and I must apologise if any of you are disappointed to learn that the history segments are going to be cut, but I think from a cold, clinical, analytical perspective, I think this will be the best middle ground in satisfying the majority of the show's viewers, particularly since I've now covered all the anniversaries over the course of the year this series has run, and any missions in the future that are significant to be featured in any anniversary segment would get covered in the last week and this week segments of upcoming videos. So nothing thing is really lost there. If you want to help support the show like these lovely folks scrolling on screen, then you can sign up to my Patreon using either the description or on-screen links. Or if you want, you could also join my channel's membership program by clicking the join button below the video and you get a cool badge next to your name as well as a host of emojis to spam in the comment section. There are also two videos on screen from me that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully you'll agree. And hey, if you enjoyed this video, then I do always appreciate a little like and a comment. It really helps me stay above water. Anyway, I've said my piece, so goodbye.